I'd firstly like to officially welcome each and every one of you on behalf of Peace in Kurdistan and myself, Mahmoud Patel, the chairperson of the Kurdish Human Rights Action Group in South Africa. We are privileged and honored to have with us this afternoon four dynamic and keynote speakers who are activists and been involved in liberatory as well as struggle politics in South Africa for a long time. Some prior to 94, like Comrade Marcus, who's a stalwart of our freedom and liberation movement. We have with us Comrade Marcus Solomon, who has been a political and community activist for all of his life. He's a qualified teacher. He served on Robben Island after being found guilty of subversion, as well as attempting to overthrow the apartheid state by violent revolution and guerrilla warfare. He was convicted to Robben Island for a decade, from 1964 to 1974, together with the late Professor Alexander, Neville Alexander, and other comrades from the National Liberation Front. He is the founder of the Children's Resource Center, the Children's Movement, going on for four decades. They are doing sterling work in bringing solidarity, as well as enabling an environment for our children. He has also been very active as an internationalist in the Palestinian movement, uh, the solidarity from South Africa, and more importantly, as an ardent uh, supporter and stalwart for the Cubans, as well as a friend of the Cubans for many years. He is also a firm supporter of the Kurdish issue, in particular the Kurdish Human Rights Action Group in South Africa. Comrade uh, Tokozane Kenneth Kunene is the General Secretary of the Communist Party of Swaziland. The Communist Party was founded in April 2011, and as comrades and other activists know, the legislation in the Kingdom of Swaziland had banned and does ban any communist formations that do take place or attempt to take place in a lawful and in a humanitarian way. The CPS has been under attack by the monarchist regime for a long time. They increased the iron fist clamping down on the Communist Party and all cadres in Swaziland, especially with the upscale in May 2021. Under the guise of the COVID pandemic, they unleashed a brutal campaign against members of the Communist Party of Swaziland and others who were the allies in Swaziland itself. The monarchy is supported by and large by the international community as well. Then we have with us this afternoon the chairperson of the Abashadi Basanjolo movement, Comrades Bulsi Kodi, who is no stranger to this platform as well, a long supporter of our movement, as well as communes and activists in South Africa and the rest of the continent and the world, if I may add. He is the founding president of the Abashadi Basanjolo movement, or referred to internationally as the Shek Dwellers movement. He has strongly campaigned for the right to housing under the theme, housing is a human right. His calling includes safe and dignified housing for all. And under his leadership, our study membership has exceeded over 100,000, making it the biggest social movement of the impoverished who have imagined a better post-apartheid South Africa. Of course, our comrade has been awarded the Swedish government's individual and organization's recognition with the Per Anger Prize in 2021. And then finally, we have with us Comrade Zainul Abidin Gaddafi, as well as strong supporter of the liberation for Comrade Abdullah Ocalan, the Kurdish movement in particular, and as a young internationalist, he is the co-founder of the Zatsaki Foundation and the Resistance Media and Community Development located here in the Western Cape. He is the project coordinator of the Mawada Food Garden and the founder of other community formations, the Neighborhood Food Drive, as well as the director of the Holistic Organized Park for Excellence, or HOK which is a youth rehabilitation and integration and anti-gain formation. He is and was the current uh, Deputy Neighborhood Watch Patrol Organization member in Kensington. Those are the introductory opening remarks. And we are located currently in a very volatile context. The Kurdish movement at this point in time is mobilizing internationally to have a press campaign that will go live on Tuesday. Many of us will be part of that together with comrades and friends across the globe. Currently, with the world's attention focused on the resistance in Palestine, it behoves us to further ensure that the emphasis of the Kurdish struggle continues unabated and is not forgotten as well. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Comrade Zbou Zikodi, who will present to us. My comrade, as we say in South Africa, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, uh, Comrade uh, Patel. Uh, it's always an honor for me uh, to participate in this uh, wonderful um, discussions that seek to build solidarity, but most importantly, peace in our world. So um, it's also good to hear, I mean, as, as you are giving the biographies of the comrades here, I mean, the journey that Comrade Marcus himself has um, traveled is an inspiration to all of us. And we pray to mighty God to keep him and people of his caliber because we look up to your leadership. We look up, up to your wisdom, up to your um, courage, and after all, uh, up to your dignity that we have uh, demonstrated over the years uh, in the fight, not only against apartheid, but against uh, what becomes the enemy of humanity. So, Comrade Patel, um, I just want to thank the... Uh, the whole Kurdish movement for really taking a very clear stand um, against any form of oppression, not just against the Kurdish uh, people, um, as you are hearing from yourself. Also articulating what is also happening in Syria, what is also happening in, in Palestine. And I want to affirm Abakali's position in solidarity with the Palestinians. And we are saying we were watching uh, the development in Palestine, but we also believe that they have the right not only to defend themselves, but to freedom and to sovereignty and to their land. And this this is the fight that we all want to wage our support to. Now, Comrade Chair, today Abakali joins the Africans for the freedom of Abdullah Akhalin, of course, a project of the Kurdish Human Rights Action Group for He's resilient, really. Um, and, and, you know, when I think of him, I think of, you know, of people who really are selfless in terms of um, offering their whole humanity on behalf of so many. Uh, because his arrest, uh, as I understand, is not just about him, but it's about the, the, the freedom of the Kurdish um, nation as well. So such inspiring um, individuals and leaders would always um, suffer on behalf of all of us who seek peace and justice. So today we express our full solidarity also um, on all the Kurdish community that continue to be oppressed, marginalized, and who are denied freedom to self-determination and sovereignty. And we think you have a right um, to really um, continue your struggle until there is real freedom for the Kurdish um, uh, uh, nation. We stand in solidarity with you, and I must say that internationalism is the way to go. I'm not surprised that uh, you have built this platform, you have identified allies, and I think you are on the right track. It is high time that we identify allies uh, throughout the world who will stand firm with us because we can't, we we. As we continue to struggle in our own um, spaces, but we also think democracy is the way to go. So until we win the hearts of many um, nations throughout the world um, who would then expose those who seek to oppress um, the Kurdish nation, and we think it's, it's, a, it's a good, uh, really, um, struggle that you are not just mobilizing within the... Kurdish community in Turkey, but also international communities, because international solidarity is really important at the time where it is most needed. Now, we have, as a Basali, uh, the Sheikh Dollars movement, we have lost at least 25 activists to assassination since 2009. And guess what? Uh, we once fought against apartheid, against colonialism, and we thought... 30 years after our democratic dispensation, there will be peace, freedom, and unity. But unfortunately, um, I just want to remind participants in this platform that again, the very black majority and the legitimate government of the day has also taken the very route that was taken by the apartheid government. So many of us live in deep poverty. Many of us are now being threatened and killed for standing firm for what is right for humanity. So Abakali represents the shack dwellers, but the marginalized as well in South Africa. 
we also represent and we stand firm with the minorities of these countries, particularly the migrant communities. Also, the as you would understand, that South Africa is facing a lot of um, um, you know challenge in terms of you know ordinary South Africans waging a war against migrant communities in this country. We stand also in solidarity with the LGBTIQ plus communities who are also facing the very oppression because it is our belief that a person was created in the image of God and who are we to judge people and who are we, you know, to decide on the fate of people. So we believe in the real freedom. So we stand with the minority and and, and apologetically so. So unity and courage of ordinary men and women have sustained and strengthened our resistance. Today, we want to encourage you to use the power of unity, the power of courage, and the power of unity to liberate the oppressed coding nations and nations throughout the world who are facing oppression. But for the release of Comrade Abdullah Okelin, who continues to suffer in custody without his family, his legal represent representative being able to have access to him. What a crime that we all have to stand firm and condemn publicly. So comrade, I'm not going to waste your time, but our message as the Shrek Dwellers Movement of South Africa is that we stand for peace, we stand for unity, and Abathan has become a, a movement of courage and dignity. And I want to say to you all, and I want to say to the whole Kurdish movement, that despite the serious oppression, vandalization of your life and dignity, but you ought to demonstrate the kind of a society that you want to build. It's not only when you are free that you need to think of it. You have to demonstrate this. In the midst of so much violence and oppression, I urge you that you become a movement, a community, a nation of dignity and courage. I thank you. Thank you very much, Comrades Buzikodi, for your words that you've shared with us and wine with them. I would just like to briefly thank you for emphasizing the power of unity. Unity and courage are the key words you have used. And to make a call to the movement as well as all the activists internationally that peace, unity, and courage brings dignity in the struggle against violence and in the midst of all the turmoil that we find ourselves in. Comrades Po Sikodi, on behalf of us, to you and the Abbasali movement, we thank you very much for honoring us with your time this afternoon. We wish you well, comrade, and we look forward to seeing you again on Tuesday and thereafter on our other platforms as well. All the best to you, strength and solidarity, and safe travels, my comrade. Everything of the best. Wonderful. Wanda. Uh, our next presenter for this afternoon will be Comrade Marcus Solomon. Comrade Marcus Solomon, we look forward to your education. And uh, the floor is yours, Comrade Marcus Solomon. Uh, comrade uh, Mahmoud and the membership of Clark. And thank you for the invitation to me to share with this wonderful platform with you, wonderful people, comrade, as Moe's just spoken. Uh, and I'm really honored to be in the presence of people like comrade Kunene, yourself, and all the wonderful people here today. Um, I think it's a very opportune moment for us to meet. And especially under the themes, resilience, resistance, and international solidarity. By way of starting, I'd like to, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. By way of starting, I'd like to Define what is meant by resilience, resistance, and international solidarity. Res res resilience means to withstand or recover quickly from difficulties, 
It can only mean, also mean toughness. Resistant means to refuse to comply or accept something that is not acceptable to you or the broader community in which you live. Then, of course, international solidarity means cooperation amongst organizations, institutions. But for the purpose of my input here today, I'd like to make a difference, a slight difference, but an important change and say international solidarity, that is solidarity based on a worldview that is internationalist, one that sees the world with human humanity and nature as one. The aim then is to unite all people of the world under one united you, you, humanity, 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 living in harmony with each other, and very importantly today in the context of the climate struggle with nature. I would like to argue that in the context of the struggle against new liberal capitalism and the context that is a very divided and uncoordinated global struggle. No. Resilience, resistance, and internationalist solidarity are very connected and interrelated. We need to be resilient when we resist, but we also need a common view that will unite us together unite us, one that accepts that we are part of one world, one humanity, in all its diversity, and that's one that is in harmony and in solidarity with nature. It has, therefore, to be internationalist. It's a world that is a view that you and the individual and communities, especially in our country today, <laughs> that gives us an insight into each other's humanity. In fact, Marx made a very important point. Our main wealth is each other. Our wealth lies in each other's solidarity with each other. But it's not only a Marxist socialist point of view. All the great religions and faiths have always had that view that we are one people. There's only one motherland in the world, and that is our common humanity across the globe. I'm of the belief, but also it's a lesson from history, that we need this internationalism so that we can be resilient and we can struggle as long as it needs to be struggled. I also need to pay tribute in the wonderful example that the Kurdish movement has given the world through the resistance. And especially, I want to pay tribute and homage to the wonderful women of the Kurdish people. In fact, later on, I want to argue That is through a pro international movement of women, solidly based in our respective movements and our respective countries, that humanity will be taken forward. I work in the children's sector and I've been working there for 40 years. Years out Africa today, and in fact, in a lot of communities across the globe, it is mothers and women that continue the struggle. Uh, a Marxist scholar recently made the point, I don't think we need scholars to inform us, that the system, the capitalist system, is, has three pillars on which it exploits and exists. It's wage capital, and significantly, the labor of care and reproduction. In other words, it's the role that women have played in sustaining our communities. But it also subsidizes the capital system. In fact, in our country, for almost 200 years now, the mining system, the mining industry, have paid 
hustling wages to the males working in the mines, while the women, thousands of them, have lived on the land in the rural areas to bring up their children and providing the time when those workers have been spewed out by the mining industry. But coming back to the Kurdish people, they don't only need our solidarity. They're not just waiting for help. They have been a model of what it means to resist. But not only to resist, but in a meaningful way. As one, it was Commandant Marcus who said, the means are the end. What did the Kurdish people have done, especially the women? They developed models like the communes to show what it means for us not only to exist now, but they've also shown the way forward. In fact, in our movement, and I'll come back to that later, we firmly believe that it's through a system of communes for young people, especially for children now, especially for children who have lost their parents, the fathers, in the mothers. It's, it's the per Recently, uh, I've been involved with an effort through the Friends of Cuba Society, and I've been asked to coordinate that campaign. Nine years ago, although it's become dormant, but we certainly are going to revive it. There's a need for a coordinated grassroots movement within our own countries. Mothers, youth, including children, and I'll come back to show that children have been involved in a number of campaigns, awareness raising programs to build internationalist solidarity. In other words, a solidarity based on the understanding that a human being is only a human being. The other day, Ulundu, Gamuntu, Babotu means you are only a person, a human being, because of other people. <laughs> My years of 40 years of work with the children emerged out of the community struggles of the 70s and the 80s. Because it was mothers who drew our attention to the need to look at the issue of children. And what we discovered through our studies and interacting with children, that children have a vital role to play in building not only the future, they can't be the future, unless they have a now. The great uh, Russian scholar, uh, psychologist in the 20s already, the last century, did research Chep or Vygotsky. Following on the work of Jean Piaget, French child psychologist and activist, the children have a powerful agency from the time they are born, they are co-constructors of the world. And a good mother will tell you how that happens. And on the basis of that philosophy, we decided that we would build a movement of children. And for the last 40 years, it's been the most amazing experience because they've been involved in supporting the Palestinian movement, struggles across Africa, etc. And what we've also realized, and it applies to all of us, especially for the solidarity movement, it's one thing to say you're an internationalist, but how do you demonstrate it in the context of, especially now like Comrade Margaret Owen has indicated or just shared the terrible experiences that they are now under ways of, it's almost a process, it is a process of genocide. By a member country of an international 
institution like United Nations. How do we, and how can we accept that? I think a big challenge then for us is how do we build a grassroots solidarity movement? And I think in the context of the climate, the threats of the, to, to the climate, the very environment in which humans and all life needs to survive, how do we build a, a grassroots movement that's firmly based, as I've tried to explain or show, with a philosophy and a worldview that clearly shows, and history is lots of examples of that. For 600 years, indigenous people have fought the colonialist, like the Amazon parts of the world in South America, Asia. It's the indigenous people who fought for their right to exist and in an environment, both physical, material, and spiritual, that we need a firm understanding and realization that we are part of a bigger world, we're part of nature, we come from there, and we owe it to our children to ensure that we build a solidarity movement on earth that has a deep understanding, both spiritual and mental and intellectual understanding that we need to fight for our environment so that we can continue to exist. Because unless we do that, we will not survive. Our future lies in each other. When we started the children's movement many years ago and the civic movement, the majority of the people involved in those struggles were women. And when you look across the globe now in the environment movement, in our own country, in, uh, in the Ambadiba Crisis Committee, it's mainly women. The reason for that is not only an intellectual exercise for mothers, like in the townships, when mothers take on the gangsters, they take on the extreme hunger that their children are suffering. It comes from a, a mother's instinct to protect a, a life that comes from a... In fact, a, a, the women's movement in India, for example, and the Dalit movement, and poor women of the poor, they ever recognize that. That unless they fight for the land and the water, others won't do it unless they are committed to some socialist movement or whatever. But for mothers, it's a question of physical survival with and for their children. So we, we need to build a, a women's movement in this country, across the African continent, that stand with and learn from the women of the Kurdish people. The, the food scientists in this country and across the globe and also climate scientists have shown that we need a system change now. And some of these scientists, highly qualified in the climate justice movement, I mean, in the, in the study of the climate environment change, the food movement, they've shown clearly that is the exploitative capitalist system that only produces for profit. That is the cause of the danger to the planet today. And we therefore need them again a movement that has resilience, that has resistance, that is informed by a world vision that says we are one with the planet, with each other. 
generally we call it an internationalist viewpoint, an internationalist worldview. But unlike in the past, where it's understood only to mean a solidarity amongst people working in the factories, today it means a solidarity with nature, with the trees of the world, marine life, the plant and the, the insects and the plants. Because our whole and our whole uh, livelihood, our whole existence depends on oxygen, which is only created by trees. Our food systems. We are dependent on the environment, but ultimately, and equally important, we need each other to survive. I'll use an example. The floods that struck Mozambique last year, it didn't stop on the borders of Mozambique. Nature knows no artificial borders. It, the wind and the storms and the water flooded across into Malawi, into Tanzania, into our own country. So these artificial boundaries must not be the boundaries that keep us from each other. And like we've learned from struggles across the globe over many hundreds of years, it is although the capitalist system, the exploitative system is so powerful, uh, much of what we've gained, we've lost. We have to revive our struggle on a basis of a very deeply spiritual commitment to each other. And it can only be done through the resilience, through the resistance that is informed by a worldview which is very spiritual. And it doesn't only come from the socialist movement. Humanity is always over thousands of years had that view. Confucius, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, and others. That is only through our being brothers and sisters from a common humanity that we will survive, arrive at the place like Conrad has moved from, uh, uh, I've said earlier, built on peace, solidarity, love. In the children's movement, it's about respect for each other, respect for nature, and love and care for each other. Thank you very much. I won't speak too much so that we can exchange and share uh, our experiences with each other, but it's been an absolute wonderful occasion. In fact, I, our dream in the children's movement, and we have to some extent it succeeded. Our dream still is that we must build a children's movement based on not the, that they are a future. They can only be the future if they have a now, the love and the care, the material, emotional, and spiritual sustenance that comes from a united, undivided struggle of people across the globe. I thank you. Thank you very much, Comrade Marcus, for your presentation. Your salient points about our solidarity, not only with one another as human beings, but together with nature and the importance of our solidarity in that context is what would build a better future for us. Your emphasis throughout your presentation on the importance of children, women, our mothers, in the South African context, as well as in the Kurdish and other international contexts we find ourselves in, is very important and vital. Mm -hmm. It was Abdullah Ocalan who spoke about the freedom of women more than any other leader in the last century. In fact, the only one, and I stand for correction. However, I would like also to quote something from his publication, from a publication beyond state power and violence where Comrade Ochelan tells us in the opening pages, and it's very connected to what you have spoken about, the mother and the child. 
where he said, the fact that the mother is the main socializing force is a scientifically proven fact. That's in his wonderful preface. He then goes on to say, yes, he then goes on to say, Comrade Marcus, my first crime as to my own self was to view this mother's right as doubtful and to make decisions about my own socialization early on and my own. He then goes on to say, he then dared to live alone with human society according to the latest scientific findings, a unique creation of at least 20 billion years. Without a mother and a master is worthy of examination. Had he taken his mother's grave warnings, he tells us, that would have been, as a child, that, that hesitancy to feel free, neither fearing that, would not have happened because of the need of that love of a mother, as well as the mother's honor, dignity, and that must be protected in order to ensure. However, he goes on to tell us much more, not only in beyond state power and violence and the prison writings, it is legion what he has meant to many in the Kurdish movement and outside. Comrade Marcus, you have also exemplified those ideas of Comrade Ochalan, which he speaks to, to us from that island through the words we have from him. The other important point was the issue of faith to build an internationalist grassroots movement on the principles of your four-decade-plus experience. And as a resolute and resistant South African who has shown us that you were prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice then and your continued struggle now, we take leap from your courage and your continuous efforts in ensuring a better, not only tomorrow, but a today. Thank you very much, Comrade Marcus, for sharing with us this afternoon. We would like to please call on Comrade Kenneth Kunene. Comrade Kenneth, are you with us? The floor is yours, my comrade. Please uh, proceed. Friends, if Comrade Kenneth is having connectivity problems, then I suggest Comrade Zainul Abedin is with us. He may then proceed. And when Comrade Kenneth gets back to us, we'll ask him then to continue thereafter. Comrade Zainul Abedin, uh, kindly continue. The floor is yours, my good comrade. Uh, thank you, comrade. Uh, Zambi, are you able to see me? I'm not too sure what the position is. You able to see me well? Yes, we can see you. Is that better? Okay. Beautiful. Uh, good afternoon, my respected uh, comrades, uh, fellow revolutionaries. Um, firstly, allow me to give my gratitude and to say thank you for having us uh, on this program to represent the Zaksaki Foundation and of course to be involved in this uh, discussion. I think that when we speak to international solidarity, when we speak to solidarity amongst the oppressed, it is always a discussion that has immense benefit for all of us that are working on the path of liberation, the path of upliftment, and of course the path of development for our people, for our societies, and our communities. Um, my introduction to the issue of the Kurds and Comrade Abdullah Ochalan, his arrest, his unjust incarceration, and uh, the persecution of the Kurdish people comes uh, probably much later than many of you. Um, and when we were introduced to this matter, of course, as somebody whose heart is on the court of the oppressed, um, it was a very interesting matter and we were obliged by the humanity within us to support the plight of um, our comrades in Kurdistan and, of course, the plight of comrade leader Abdullah Ochalan. When we come together for any particular matter with regards to the liberation and the development of people, we have to stand in solidarity um, with one another across our different plights. The world has become a global village. Before, perhaps in the time of many of you comrades, when you were younger, if we saw something happening like we see today, the operation um, Al-Aqsa flood in Palestine, you probably should have waited maybe a few weeks um, to get the pictures and to get the information of what's currently happening on the ground. Of course, in the age of information, the world has become a global village. And we are getting live, um, minute to minute, even second to second updates um, with regards to various developments in the world. And when we are connected in such a way, 
it becomes impossible for people with humanity to be silent and to be unmoved by the plight facing a different people. Therefore, today in our context in South Africa, after we have faced apartheid and a liberation struggle for a democratic dispensation, it is impossible that we remain silent and we remain unmoved when we see the plight of people in Kurdistan that are facing the same or if not worse challenges than what we face um, under the apartheid regime. I remember in reading on uh, the plight of the of, of Kurds in Turkey, for instance, the, um, the Kurdish language cannot be used neither in books nor in restaurants, nor can the names, can Kurdish names be used openly. If you have an establishment, for instance, um, if you are Kurd and you have a restaurant, you cannot use a Kurdish name as um, on, the, on your restaurant. It's illegal. You can face incarceration and you can even be um, targeted by the state. Of course, this and other injustices facing the Kurdish people is something that affects all of us. We cannot be unmoved when people are oppressed. We cannot be silent when people are oppressed, especially when we see the resilience of the Kurdish people. In South Africa today, we face various challenges. We face a dire poverty. We have people, children, mothers, fathers, that go to bed without a meal to eat. That children cannot go to school because the parents don't have uh, money to buy them school shoes. They don't have means to send them to school with a lunch. They don't have means, for instance, to buy them school clothing, or they don't have means um, to allow those children to be transported to school. We have the challenge of education. Uh, children are not getting an education. So we see the continuation of generational poverty. In other places in the world, we speak to generational wealth, that you inherit the wealth from the previous generation. In a country like South Africa and in our communities, we speak to generational poverty, where poverty is inherited. Parents are in dire poverty. Children are in dire poverty, cannot get an education. Where our youth, for instance, they turn toward alcohol and towards drugs so that they can manage the pain of going to bed with a hungry belly. As a result of this, we see all kinds of evils creep into our societies, the vast usage of drugs, youth joining gangsterism, and we see the cycle of poverty continuing. As a result of what? Of capitalism, we have big business that are exploding. Exactly. Thank you so much, Comrade. Thank you, Comrade. It's just a left us for the moment. Yes. Sorry about that. It's the issue with the <laughs> activity, but uh, that should be in order now. And uh, thank you so much for your presentation as well. And uh, the issues that you raised, that was quite key early on in your presentation, which resonates very well with uh, a text I quoted earlier from Beyond State Power and Violence by Abdullah Ocalan was the issue of generational wealth versus generational poverty. In our context in Southern Africa, not only South Africa, Swaziland, Botswana, Namibia, Mozambique, what's happening in Cabo Delgado at the moment with the gas, the issues of Daesh and so on, together with the mobilization of the African troops there we find that it speaks to what uh, Abdullah Ocalan spoke about. He said, one of the most important goals of proving that, and these words were the sorcery of the relationship between capital and profit, is far greater than any sorcerer and more cruel than the most cruel god king. No other century has been as cruel and bloody as the 20th century. And that words ring very true when you speak about generational poverty in our context. We can't even fathom generational wealth as it is in other parts of the northern states, in parts of Europe, North America, and parts of Middle East where there are those who are far removed from the individuals and communities that they oppress. 
Thank you for your presentation, Comrade Zainul Abidin. Uh, I am not sure if Comrade Kenneth is back with us. It would be excellent, uh, my comrade, if you're back with us and you can uh, proceed with your presentation. Yes, can I confirm that, my comrade? Thank you very much, comrade Kenneth. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you so much, comrade. And uh, it's our pleasure to be in this important uh, seminar in honoring the work of comrade uh, Abdullah Kali. We were introduced to the credit struggles by Comrade Rhodes. Uh, it was uh, in 2013, and we aligned ourselves with the struggle of the credit and we updated our understanding. But in particular, <coughs> we had to take a lot of strike of the writings and works of Comrade uh, Abdullah Kali. But in the main, we were inspired by the resilience and the fighting spirit of the women. We, I think the most important one, we always been participating in the commemoration of the backlist we did a, a well, Rojavan areas. So in that way and in our own way, we were able also to omit ourselves with the strikes. And we are drawn in into a, a situation where we look at how a leader of uh, the caliber of Comrade Abdullah, who is kept for almost 25 years now in incarceration and probably for the sound reason of defending the right of existence of an important aspect of our history in the world. I think the main idea is to suppress not only the Kent people, but the important history that they are here, leaves a void that I think they Habitat is well, see no problem with doing so, and that's why we keep it up to silence and suppress the existence of the, the kids. But we are inspired with their resilience all over the years, but in the main, the continuity of what they've done, what they've offered in the world, even under suppression, denied their language, denied their identity, but they've always kept the love of the world. But they've given in to the world more important aspects of humility, character. However, since we have had and uh, shared some experiences tied with the Kurdish comrades, we have seen one important thing, the love they share, they have. I think it is quite phenomenal to us. We are in this region in Africa, in Southern Africa, and Southern, one of the countries with absolute monarchy, where human rights are extremely violated, the right and existence. Our history is still hidden, it is suppressed under the autocratic rule of Mswadi that enjoys a good support from imperialist forces. We could agree that it is not as bad as it is, but enjoys the, the regime enjoys the support or the influence of most of the superpowers. The United States, UK, European Union countries, Japan, and even what we normally call certain imperialist countries, like the region, the province of Taiwan, Israel, and now South Korea are all connected and coordinated now to manage the system of autocratic rule now by introducing some elements of a fascism, semi-fascist com components that now have reinforced right-wing elements that have been the remnants of apartheid in South Africa and also combining them with some elements that existed within the, the system of Taiwan, the administration of Taiwan all held banned to suppress our people, press them, denying them the right. And you have seen also the influence of neoliberalism or neocolonialism in the region. That in the midst of when other countries, in particular the South Africa and other comrades in the different countries, have pronounced it very clearly that Southern must be democratized. But you have seen in the last uh, a week, Sadak making up a, a pronouncement that sharp elections that are in hell in conditions only to help court the repressive regime in the way that it is democratic, whereby there is absolute power, no rights to participate, all can participate, banned, all can activities, tortured, detained, and our party members have always been in the past, in the, in the period now, the main target of such impression, short edge by weapons and guns that are also now mobilized from elsewhere, security shifts into the country. And in the main, we still not sure of the number of people that are dying on daily basis by the system. Since 2021, the hatred of the system 
Okay, have grown unprecedentedly, and this is the kind of situation that now we are waiting. It's like other more comrades forced to exile, others have left out of their countries, but thousands are also kept in jail. Others are buried secretly by the regime because of uh, the mass murder that is now taking place in our country. But order to see Sadak presiding and reinforcing the regime and claiming nothing has happened in our conditions and also putting a, a very formal blanket in the name of the imperialist forces that are in charge of the region today to define that there is no way that a revolution in Sweden must wait. But one important aspect that we can share, relating very well with the, most of the critical work of Comrade Mikhail, the question of uh, solidarity and mobilization across national states. And I think that is one of the most important parts that I think we need to fight for. So far, we rely on the lines of solidarity in South African comrades. We have not seen much strength within the other parts of the region, not only on our strike, but in general, the strike is taking place in the West. We see that the region is still suppressed. The issues of the DRC are not well attended in the region, including now the question of refugees in a very difficult position to be angled in. I think it is quite very important that the solidarity movement is being placed in, but failing up from what exists presently about how imperialism reorganizes again Africa when we see that the Pan Africanist movement moves and try to mobilize and but needs also to be reinforced and also to give it its just content details for this other element because if it only relies on having its African content of the old course, I think it will miss most of the most practical aspect of the class like that is where all over the world. That working class people are suffering throughout the world. And as the HIT in your present summer that have seen the addition of capitalism now make sure that in the areas where or so, as now now be exposed or shared in the world. We have seen it in, in, in many states in the region. And therefore we believe therefore that the movement shared to be sustained and the most important part, as stated, it must win over the majority of the people that just to stand up and fight this system and create a new order in this region. And in particular, now the region that is still under a very strict and, and, and under a severe threat of any conflict and conflict, the reaction that South African people are responding to without lack of consciousness, without lack of practical mobilization of feeling the open, we may find that now they will regress the strike that have been waged in the region. Now the element where we can people now begin to develop hatred among each other when they're supposed to own each other now. I think that is the most important as our party stands in that ground, in that condition, in the atmosphere where we understand that it is quite very difficult to organize under these conditions. But when you look at how the cats have stood up their ground in different countries where they are learning much. Our pledge in Summit Logalin and the call for his release, we have to magnify within our course of cycling itself. As our cycle gains also attraction, we also believe that we will and we must ensure that we break into the future the issues of the case and to make sure that our solidarity across the, the African colonization and as embassies to replace the movement must be built, but courageous people must come in and then take up their own course and mobilize uh, across the countries, across the continent, and across the region. But in the main, we need the suspended struggles in the entire region. The four people need voices and their ground must be stood, must, must, must be recognized. They must stand their ground so that it is not in a condition as it states now that we could see the separation and depression of people having this ugly face in the isolated communities. And whilst we see the contest over the developed areas, small as they might be in countries, and then we see that political elitism is now attracted to the work on of imperialism that probably to address the fundamental issues that are in our community. And we believe it is quite very important. And as we have clearly said, in the center of this mobilization, the young, the children, the women, they're all now at the most vulnerable people in this condition. And their circumstances, they die easily 
and their debt is also the complex as part and parcel of compiling statistics. Probably the, that tend to this part of that problem because the truth in the reality is that these elements now that are exposed African youth in the region also is now displaced from within their communities and they are now criminalized. Whenever a youth is seen on the street moving around, I think it is open attraction to any system then think that there must be something done, there must be a guarantee, a guarantee, and all sort of conditions that define youth and stigmatizing youth as criminal. I think that is the important part that our party also tried to raise in the country, that the youth and uh, our young people in the country stand up and define who they are and what they stand for, because the short-term cause and objective of trying to manage life in this environment is progress. As capitalism still reinforces the and build its strength within states so that it can continuously repress society. Then the youth become victims, and it is important that the standing up of the ground is quite important. So the, 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 the state of affairs we see in our own country in Southern, which is actually now as we enjoy a platform with this, with our comrades here in the case and the call for the release of a combat ecuador it also offers us the right platform that share that allows us also to share spirit and element of solidarity. Otherwise, we might we have always been in the board and are training to redefine ourselves. I think that is where our strength has been developed. Where we've gained our most strength is that we need to explain ourselves and need the cause that we want to ask ourselves why it is so difficult for the world to understand that it is criminal to keep a system of absolute power that has got no respect for human rights in Swaziland. And in the main, it is because it helps to eliminate the unwanted population. The old theories of Malthus and so on are implemented that there is an unwanted population in Swaziland. The only interest area now is the land space for geopolitical reasons. And if that is the case, then we can see the facilitation and only when the people who are affected by that and through mobilization, through organization, that must stand, must stand the ground and defend the right of humanity. It is a contribution to history. It's a contribution massively to Marxism that every, in this course, in this era of moribund capitalism, where it is helpless and is hell bent to destroy everything, it has destroyed the environment. But I think it is up to the humanity to rise up and our party stand the ground that it is important that this movement must be built irrespective of the hardship, the condition that we are exposed to. But I think the movement has come in. And now what is quite more important is that it must integrate because the condition now affects not only the working class, but in the main, also the big class in of society are being suppressed. They do not know whether they have houses or they do not know they don't have. They also do not know and understand that should they continue to work or they should take up their savings and consume them now because it is clear now that even today, savings of the people which are supposed to get pension is now used by capitalism to advance not only the interests of progress of society, but to advance war and defend status quo that have got nothing to do with anybody. And therefore, it is important that the movement in Africa, in the region, should stand up. As we have stated, in Malawi, we have seen the Sutu, the conditions are unbearable. And we have seen now the intermigration of people and how now systems are trying to enforce against migration. I guess they are other people. I think it also creates a very important impetus that the only option is to mobilize the resistant capacity. I think I, I, I we, it is also in our own energy when you define the Swazi pro democracy movement. We are saying as a communist party, it must have a resistance capacity. It must be seen in fighting and engaging in into practice that affect the society, in particular where we have rural communities where it is very difficult for people to survive. The fight for survival is now the basis of what our humanity must have. And therefore, it must have a character. And therefore, militancy is quite an important aspect in mobilization, where it cuts across a current system. And another most important situation that we have seen in Southern, how religion is being used against the people. We have seen how the rock system use culture and use religion to reinforce and build this foundation in this ideology. And we have also seen probably the same way that you might have seen mobilization in Turkey, uh, how it is mobilized now against people to deny people the right to worship, the right to also believe by making it an opinion that it suppresses those kind of rights and using religion on another note instead of probably allowing people to enjoy those kind of privileges they have in society that.
So the fight for the rights is quite important. And we also in last year pledge our unwavering support again. That yes, we have seen it out raising this opinion. Our Congress also when so that when incarcerated also face no way when it is our routine route that there can be a condition that leaders of revolutions can be suppressed, they can be detained and they can be exposed into those conditions. It happened with Comrade Nelson Mandela, it is said with a colon, but I think it is now a, a, a routine, a lifestyle of obsessive does that they can destroy the movement by arresting, suppressing, also exposing leaders into that. So that kind of an example must come to an end. We need to make sure that we organize and rally and strengthen our movement and organize very strongly to say whenever the reg a regime starts to act against our own cause, we also need to show character and be strong. The movement must have its own object obligation and make sure that it is the world order that must be changed. It is a system that must be overcome, overthrown, and your order must be established and it must be done through excessive mobilization. We, uh, uh, can we share our our, our input to this far and appreciate this moment that we have conversed. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Comrade. Yeah, Abney, beautiful. Extremely well articulated, my comrade. You touched on very many issues that have been covered by our other presenters as well. You've emphasized the challenges that you have in particular in Swaziland. A monarchy that's inimical to the aspirations of not only you as the organized formation as the Communist Party, but to all those who are aspiring for greater freedoms. You are speaking of disappearances, arbitrary detention, killings, and the suppression of information on those very same atrocities that are taking place, very much like the apartheid state perpetrated pre-94. And what is more dismal for us to hear is that the regional SADC partners, including our own very state here, are complicit in what is taking place there to prop up the monarchy in the region. Those struggles and your challenges have been supported by comrades in South Africa, as well as the continent and elsewhere. But as you rightly point out, the momentum for a stronger, resilient mobilization must take place to ensure that we can overcome the system in place, which is identified as capital, neoliberalism, and so on. But of course, we do find theoretical answers as well as practical attempts to overcome state systems and what they do globally. We see that in Rojava, we see that in other parts of the communes in southern Spain and attempts that are made elsewhere. However, the issue of xenophobia, the issue of migrancy from Lesotho to South Africa and back, in other words, the mining industrial complex and how it's serviced and replicated. And it ties in with Comrade earlier who spoke about generational poverty as well as the challenges of our women and children. That resonates in the philosophy and ideals of Comrade Abdullah Ochalan and his very deep analysis of how one should understand these results of capital in the last century. Although he goes back at the very beginning in history with the construction of patriarchy and so on. So, Comrade Kenneth, thank you very much for your contribution this afternoon. Uh, comrades and friends that are with us, now is an opportunity to uh, raise questions, comments and suggestions. Any comrade would like to go, there is a hand feature there uh, that indicates if you would like to speak or if there's nobody uh, volunteering to ask a question, a comrade may just unmute and uh, can ask your question. Please do so, comrades. Now is an opportunity to engage. Thank you. Comrade Margaret, please go ahead. I, I'm sorry, my hearing isn't brilliant, and so I didn't hear in detail the last speaker. But thank you, all of you. It was absolutely marvelous to hear all of you talking and actually all of you so sensitive and understanding of what is at threat now, the extraordinary, unique women's revolution, the Kurdish women's revolution, 
And one of you said it, I can't remember which one, but maybe you all mentioned it. There's something quite extraordinary about the writings of Abdullah Ocalan. Because he is the only man, one of you said, the only man in human history who has ever stressed the fact that there can never be a really, truly free, democratic, just, society, and that's absolutely central to it, not on this little finely fringe thing on the edge, but actually central to it, is women's empowerment and gender equality. And he's also said, and thank you very much, um, Mahmoud, the way you keep quoting from the words of Abdullah Ocalan, but he's also said how the oppression of women oppresses the men as well, and oppresses the whole of society. And it is vital, vital, that we have all over the world, all over the world, we have solidarity on the these issues, on the freedom of Ocalan, because there can never be any hope for any peaceful solution to the Kurdish question unless he is free. And it is of great concern to all of us that I think it's now, when is it, March from two years ago, I mean many, many, more than two years, we don't even know if Abdullah Ocalan is alive or what his health is like. And we are still waiting. Correct me, Chairman, if I'm wrong, moderator, if I'm wrong. We're still waiting for the report of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture, who visited, was there on Imrali Island last September for 10 days. And we're still waiting for that. And we are, as we always say, we are many, many, many. You talked about generational, you know, that terrible difference, the generational poverty, and that in so many countries, including in the UK now, we have this unbelievable gap between the unbelievably rich, richer, I'm 91 years old now. So there's always, I've always grown up with a be rich and poor, but never on this obscene gulf between so many poor people and so many unbelievably corrupt and rich people. And now, as a human rights lawyer, what we are really worried about is that we are losing, possibly, what we thought we had after the end of the Second World War, a world order based on the rule of law. Because we see that the United Nations seems completely paralyzed. And just last week, UN Women, and I hope you, some of you have seen it, that UN Women published their snapshot 2023 on the status of women, saying that actually the status of women is worsening. We're not just standing still. There's an incredible pushback now as there are more and more regimes which are populist, right-wing, racist, and misogynist, and warmongering. At the same time, there are masses and masses of women now all over the world who picked up on the appalling murder of Masa Amani in Tehran a year ago about what was happening in Iran. But there's been a complete silence about, and you've mentioned it, about the numbers, increasing numbers of femicide and killings of, of women, not just in Turkey, but Turkey's femicide in Syria and northern Iraq. And I don't want to be, we must be, we mustn't be pessimistic. We must be optimistic. And as Mary Robinson said once, 
in every country, there are always in every country serious men who understand how actually essential it is to support the elimination of discrimination against women and to really support them so that they are there in decision making. I think what we're not doing enough about is to tell we how how unique and extraordinary this Kurdish um, women's revolution is and, and the actual unique um, essence of the, um, con, um, what do you call it, confederalism, um, that decentralization about everything to do with the ecology, about freedom of belief. I mean, this is what we need more than ever when we see everything that is happening. And it's absolutely um, extremely painful for me to see how everybody from Biden to my government, that everybody now is saying how they support Israel in what is happening in the last 24 hours, Palestine and Israel, when the appalling treatment of the Palestinians and the Israeli Arabs and the apartheid that is happening in Israel when we thought that we had got understood that apartheid is completely unacceptable from everything we learned about South Africa. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I, I won't go on. Maybe I'm talking too much. But uh, as I said at the beginning, next weekend I will be in Glasgow with about 2,000, 3,000 women. And although I'm not um, particularly supposed to be speaking about the Kurdish issue, I will have the platform. I'm talking about widows and women who are victims of war. And you've talked about um, our, our comrades from Swaziland talking about all the disappearances. So I'm talking about what conflicts and war does. The women are never decision-making in going to war. They're not the decision-makers about who we will manufacture and sell arms to but they and their children are always the victims of war. And war is creating uncounted millions and millions, not only of widows of all ages, but also what we call the half-widows, the wives of the disappeared, the wives of those who went missing. And for those women, it's even more wretched, their poverty and their status than being a widow because there's no closure. They do not know where they are. There's no, are they in a mass grave? Are they in a prison? And you know, uh, just two weeks ago, we had the UN, it was the day of the missing people because there's a UN convention on rights of people to find out the fate of their missing loved ones. I think only 59 countries have signed up to it. Turkey, oddly enough, is one of the countries that signed it. But there are masses of people missing, disappeared, and it's happening the whole time. Um, I am terribly proud, and I owe so much to Estella, who's here, because it's Estella who brought me in to become a patron of Peace in Kurdistan. And thank you, Estella, because I learn so much from you. And... I'm so grateful that this gives me uh, an opportunity to listen to you all and be with you here. Um, so we must be optimistic. There are more and more of us than there are of them. And we will overcome. And we will never, never give up on this struggle for the self-determination self for the Kurdish people. And what is so important and misunderstood and the media is always telling lies. It's never, ever about separatism. They do not want to change the borders. It's for everybody. And whether they're Arabs or they're Turkmen or they're Jews or they're Christians, it's about everybody. It's about freedom of belief. It's about saving the planet. It's about all the right things. And this is, this is the most wonderful hope for the whole of humanity, the whole human race. 
So women, life, liberty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Comrade Marcus, for your moving and inspiring words, as well as articulating so well the aspirations of all our women, including the men that are committed in the struggle for a better tomorrow. We have uh, two uh, hands that are raised, and um, uh, I'm, I can't recollect which hand went first. So if any one of the comrades whose hand was up first, please uh, go ahead and uh, comment or ask questions. We would like to hear. Thank you. And then... Uh, I'll, I'll go then, if that's okay. Uh, first, thank you very much uh, for, for everyone uh, for being here, speaking with us today. Uh, it was uh, incredible um, what you shared and uh, your, your perspective and uh, the resistance that you're part of and, and the resistance of the people there is very inspiring. And, and what you shared for uh, an internationalist perspective uh, at, a, at a human and ecological and spiritual level. Um, is very beautiful and, and very well received. Uh, and I also just want to apologize. I'm in a, in a public place now, so I apologize for any background noise. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, very briefly if um, if the friends could comment on uh, a little bit more about their understanding of self-determination as, as a kind of theme and horizon. And specifically, if they could share a bit about the what for them are the the key issues or headings in, in your immediate context and for South Africa and for the region more generally, what you see is the most pressing uh, horizons or dimensions themes. And um, I also wanted to ask on that, uh, particularly about the land issue in South Africa today, a bit about how you view the matter of land ownership, use rights, et cetera, in the context today. Thank you again very much for being with us today. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Comrade uh, Connor, for those questions. The issues of self-determination and how it's conceptualized by our panelist speakers, as well as the issue of land, and also the most uh, pressing issues that face us in the region here. I, I think we'll take uh, that's three uh, components of what you are asking our panelists to respond to. There are three of them at the moment. Uh, would uh, Comrade Kenneth go first, and then Comrade Marcus, and then Comrade Zimul Abedin? Would that be in order, my comrades? Oh, bro. It's just a question in the, that the, la the last speaker could just repeat the first part of his question. I didn't hear that so well. Uh, yes. Anna, could you please repeat the first part of your question for Comrade Marcus? Thank you. Absolutely. It was uh, about how you understand the meaning of self-determination as a concept or what that, what that okay. word means to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Fine. Thank you. Hey. I hope I'm clear, Comrade. I've changed some connection. Yes, we can hear you, Comrade Kenneth. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Issue of self-determination to... To our own view, I think that is the biggest part of the struggle is that uh, if we do not, if people lack what probably you could define, who we could say the majority of the poor people have no, they lack self-esteem, which in our own way is a, in the main, the nutshell of self-determination. In their case, it would be our background and our history helps us also to identify ourselves. But in the main, it is the freedoms that we need to have. The people must be free and their freedom must mean not only freedom to choose, but also they must have the ideas. And we believe that the people can only exercise those freedoms or that state of self-determination only when they are practically involved in how they are governed. So it is in that way that we speak strongly about the issue and completely okay, speak about confederation and meaning that if at every part of the world, at every part of any section of population across the divide, this emphasis on the against the national based state, the limitation of the national based state, was also to deal with those conditions of um, limiting people's aspect of self determination, as stated by Lenin, expressed it in another way, in a very comprehensive way, when he said those bases of making to fight for freedoms are basically. On those, on those conditions of consciousness for self-determination, that we must be able to define or you know, determine our destination. People can't choose poverty. People cannot choose 
was people cannot choose repression. If then a new order can be created, self-determination will mean a free society that is able to define and work on the basis of peace and progress on their own. So it is in that context that uh, I, I pick this subject, this area of, of engagement. I'm sure the other colleagues here will pick, and Congress will pick it in another more comprehensive way. The most critical issue in the region, in our own state, from our own perspective, position on the an outlook from the Swazi condition, but not directly on Swaziland. But we feel that the region must free itself from neocolonialism. We believe, therefore, that most of the critical aspect that defines the notion of what we mean, how we define democracy in the region, how we define progress in the region, everything is on the basis of how neocolonialism defines us. And we believe, therefore, that it will change, make up a new outlook that will attend most of what we see as critical questions. I will say the most pressing issue within South Africa now is the issue of influx of migrants. It will say the solution of the South African problem to have its own path towards progress is only when they deal with the phenomenon or problem of migration. And we believe then that it might be unlocked if only we can present a theoretical position of what do we define, what do we mean about our own progress outside the mask of neo colonialism and all its happening that is created to us. The driving poverty in our own situation is a reflection of how neo colonialism defines ourselves. So there is a need for the mobilization of defining a new order in our condition. But what could be seen as pressing and bottom line issue that cannot be ended? It is the grinding poverty. It is the division, it is the continuous increase of the gap between the rich and the poor. It is the element of the control, the, the, the strength of elites, of political elites. It is in that way where we feel things could be unlocked and ended. Because in the true sense, it is that almost in the entire region, we might have seen that the interest of surviving regimes or political systems is done at the suppression of the voices of the people. And in that case, we see that there is no shift forward. We are saying strategically at a, at a particular level, and the most critical issue in the region is the anti, with a struggle against neocolonialism. And we believe, therefore, that it can build and unite the entire people, progressive people of the region, and they can have a new outlook of theoretical interpretation of most of the dynamics that are now impediments of reflections of how these conditions now define us. We may not win any condition if only we are looking at the elements that are created by this historic system that is perpetually unattended to, but that is now gaining grip and now turning even democracies into something else and upside down. There is no now no cause for transferring of power to the people. The issue now is about surviving political elite and contestation among political elites, and it creates nothing else but it, re it divides society and it also promotes war. I think it is also necessary to see that the other most element that exists within the region is that we are in a systematic way of purging up a war condition. We may find ourselves now in the near future just speaking about ending a war or starting now to start a campaign about peace. But we are saying in the nutshell, when we look at this neocolonial aspect in the region, we may even unmask its dangers of now and even in the future. On the issue of land, in our own view, is that when you see what is happening, probably we've seen what has happened in Palestine, how Israel was occupying land. We have seen the same notion in Swaziland that the displacement of the people from their land, the land is now bought systematically, unfortunately, by a con elements that are more associated with the Israel, one or another. We have seen uh, those who are interested in buying up of the land, dividing the land from individuals. We will see ourselves probably now, also if it, our struggle delays, we'll be fighting our cause now in the similar way that the Palestinian people are exposed to fight it now, where it is now a matter of survival because the land has been termed, uh, divided over by individuals, supported and monitored by, by, any, by, by, by the, the, the elite states but in our own case, by the repressive regime. But in the, in the same notion, the, 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 
But the most fundamental aspect is that the national state or the standard government within the countries in the region have no responsibility over production. And it is doing so by surrendering most of the adequate asset of society. In our case, it would be the most wealth, existing wealth within any country developed or underdeveloped in the region. It's the land. And it is vulnerable for being used by the people to change their lives. But in the course now, it is now the asset that is now used for bargaining and defining even how a country would define its general, its, its gross democracy, domestic product. The GDP entry in the country now is being measured about even selling of land assets, not even by investment, but selling of land assets is now part and parcel of what contributes to GDP. And in the many cases, it's now a shocker. Selling out land to private people is now a shocker to economic or to financial crisis within the region. Actually, that is the most dynamic aspect that makes it even now unnecessary to keep poor population within countries. That's why you will see the health sectors in these countries neglected. People will die easily. There is nothing to manage and support survival. Promoting of the individual of people is no longer the objective. Almost everything now is more about how do we defend the fiscals of the country. And therefore, that becomes now the most important asset that is now used to shock her. And in this case, we are seeing the land, like all the minerals that are also under the land, are now vulnerable for the market. And in the course, we are seeing that this important aspect now has led even to what we call now the most mushrooming aspect of the new threat in the region, which is caused by the climate change condition. And it is in the main because of our attitude of the ruling class attitude towards land. And then it is now part and parcel of where the angle of the struggle must be to say what else are the people defending if it's not their life. It is their life and their land that must be defended. But the most important aspect is how best the land should be used. The land should be remain the most important asset of the state. By the way, state a state that has been fully controlled by the people that understand and enjoy the leverages of how the people understand it so that people understand that they can still use this land to defend even all the threats that are coming within the environment, including global warming, but in the main, to deal with the hunger that is now affecting our people. Our example in Swaziland is that it is frustrated, facilitated to ensure that the people become loyal to a dictatorship of a monarchy. Therefore, lead is now the most important angle of, 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 their, of the web war. Displacing people from land is now a criteria of controlling and dominating. So a repressive regime now uses the land as a weapon because it is known that when you've lost the land, you have got no identity, you have no character, and therefore you have nothing to do. Then people will be moving up and down all over the day, over the countries. It can also tap and undermine the whole conflict of today's movement of youth. We are aware that the youth of today that's unemployed is not involved in any production, but moreover, spend most of the time moving around as migrants and spending some of their times within prisons where they are detained, waiting for another moment where they go where they do not know. The reason is because we have not yet defined the asset of land to its correct measure, that it is where everything moves on. It is how, as Comedes, uh, Margaret is explaining, that it is only when even the environment can be defended, when we make sure that we produce our first speaker, introduction speaker, what he said, we may even defend and, pro and protect oxygen by making sure that we make use of the land. So it remains the most important asset than probably the factories and the other things that we may be thinking of because actually it can help and resolve some of the critical problems affecting our society today. Thank you, Kumbit. I hope I have said to say something of some. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Kenneth, for your response. Quite uh, comprehensive. Uh, I'd like to ask Comrade uh, Marcus to please respond, and thereafter, Comrade Zainul Abedin. Comrades, uh, I'm not going to cut you off unless we go over <coughs> eight minutes. So I'll give you the time. You can respond adequately because... Uh, once uh, all your ideas have been uh, very cogently put across, it would make the discussion much more fruitful for us going forward when we do the edits and so on. So please go ahead, uh, Comrade Marcus. Yeah. Well, Comrade, thank you very much. I, I, for the reason that you've mentioned, I think this is such a vital uh, engagement. Many of the questions cannot be asked 
in the in the manage should be addressed in this forum. So I, my point on the issue of self determination and the issue of land is that uh, what some of these issues have, it's like in the past, like in the late in the twentieth century, that the the right of nations to self determination and groups, etc. But in the context of climate change, some of those criteria cannot be used anymore. Climate has changed the whole dynamic of how regions and areas must be treated. Like in Southern Africa, I mentioned it earlier. A flood in Swaziland, I mean in, in Mozambique, the, the typhoon, covers the whole of the Southern region. And then the, the national borders, which is really just a fence or whatever, does not help in addressing this issue. In fact, it becomes more problematic. What I do want to say, of course, that self-determination is a matter that must be discussed precisely under this banner of international solidarity. Cooperation amongst communities. What does that mean? For example, the issue of land is not only about land. Land is the defined is the water, the seas, etc. And like Comrade, Comrade Kelly has shown, the seas, for example, right now in South Africa, the sea is being used as a as a means of creating wealth for the few, but at the expense of destroying a whole ocean, a marine life around our coast. It has will have disastrous consequences for everybody in the region. Yeah. The issue of, we have the issue of hunger, for example. We have four million, four million children who are stunted, 10 million children in this country. And I'm not speaking about the adults who are unemployed and the youth. 10 million ch other children go hungry every day. It's only when people have access to land. Like Comrade Musbo, uh, from uh, Abashlali will explain 100,000 of Sheikh dwellers just in his movement are constantly being evicted right now in Soweto, just outside the way to a whole settlement has been uh, closed down. So the issue of land needs a mass movement coordinated okay, that will occupy if necessary. So we need a coordinated informed movement. The other issue that relates to land is food production. It's not only about living. Now, the food production depends on water. And what is happening in Southern Africa, climate scientists have predicted, South Southern Africa is going to experience some of the worst droughts on the planet. In Sudan right now, it's not about tribal or ethnic location. <laughs> it's the part control of basic resources like water. In our own country, the 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 the, the, the northern parts of the country, daily thousands of people, especially children suffer huge amounts of ill health because of the way the mines have destroyed the water system, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm basically is saying is that we need, and I think this, this discussion is so vital, mustn't see it as an end in itself. It needs to be part of a, a process that must accelerate the unity across the board. South Africa, and it comes to the issue again of the right to self-determination. South Africans in the, see people from other countries that have helped Swaziland, uh, Lesotho, Zimbabwe, as, as foreigners. So how do we raise the awareness and the necessary infrastructure to raise practical involvement with each other, concrete, so that we begin to understand what it means 
to go survive, to, to, to survive. I think the climate change threat, the, the threat to climate change has brought new threats. That has brought many challenges, especially around these issues of what is self-determination, who does South Africa belong to? Who does Southern Africa belong to? Who put the tree? What do the, where, who, were, who owns the trees, the oceans? And like Comrade Kenneth would say, these have become bargaining tools. Not even, they, they don't even, our Minister for, for, for Environment is just allowed the, one big company to use our oceans to drill. You know what that means? So I really think I, I can go on and on. But I think the what this discussion has indicated as discussions are going on and on, what we need to do is to commit ourselves to create, because the debate helps, but in order for clarification. It's not to change the situation. We need to build a, a movement across the country, across the continent, to make the change possible, the issue of land ownership. You know, there's a, a, a organization called Africa is a country. I engage with some of them from time to time. And I think in many parts of the, of the continent now, there's a common understanding that, and especially in the Western part, Western part of the, of the continent. So I really think what the questions have raised is the challenge to to the, the panel and the organizations participating, the party of Swaziland, our own formations in South Africa, etc. My last point is this is about uh, the need for social force change. Children constitute almost more than half of our continent's population. They need huge resources to survive. And the first, the most important part in the life of a child are the first thousand days. Now, it's not a mother or even a good family that can enable those children to live beyond a climate disaster. It will need a huge amount of solidarity, understanding, etc. So the challenge then, let us create some program that will continue the discussion so that we can learn from the Kurdish movement, other movements, people in Europe, etc., etc. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Marcus, for your response as well. Uh, before we proceed any further, there is one more hand up, and before we get to that question, uh, one of our panelists also had to leave now, Comrade Zainul Abedin. There's some emergency he has to attend to, and he's given us an apology. And he thanks everybody for the time that they spent here, and he hopes his contribution has also been received. The points I just want to emphasize again, besides gender, patriarchy, the political economy issues, the internationalism and alliance building, the important point raised here by uh, Comrade Marcus was one on social ecology as well, the ecological crisis and how that must force us to re-understand and reconceptualize our current reality. That's quite important and it should be taken very seriously as we go forward, especially in South Africa now, where it's basically a free-for-all with conglomerates and uh, companies that are using everything at their disposal. The law itself seems at times not to be enough to be justiciable to ensure that those rights are protected. The end of the person that's up, I can't see the name, it just says fellow Jitsa. Can you please ask your question, Comrade Tenet and Comrade uh, Marcus Williams? Thank you. Okay, yeah, Steve here from the Peace and Courtesy Ecology, uh, Ecology Group. Um, yeah, my camera's not working for some reason. I don't know why, but I will certainly um, speak to my question. So, yeah, thanks so much for all the, the range of points and uh, experience sharing this afternoon. has been really, really fascinating for me. I've just taken a bit of a back seat. I've been listening in intently, however. 
Um, I, the, the, the question I wanted to raise and I was interested in, and uh, social ecology has just been mentioned, is the relationship between unity and diversity in the internationalist context. So um, recently I've been working on some research on social ecology and food production and food allocation. And one of the main, as that's to social ecology, one of the main principles of that has been internationalism. So that's obviously great interest to me today. Um, but but I would say, I'm only speaking to the UK context, internationalism isn't really a concept that's really talked about in public discussions or even political discussions very much in, in the UK. Um, it, it's uh, If it is, it tends to be marginalised and dismissed. Um, either it's something that, or oh, if you're an internationalist, you would just want to erase different um, or you're trying to create some kind of autocratic world regime, um, or that, or that uh, we've got separatist intentions, or that was something that Margaret, you mentioned that earlier, that that idea of the, the Kurdish movement being dismissed as separatists, separatists. So it's kind of dismissed for all these reasons, and internationalism is uh, so it isn't really discussed that much. Um, but obviously, for me, it's capitalism that tends to be totalizing and erases difference. Um, and I think international in, uh, industrial agriculture is probably a good example of that, the way that um, it pushes towards monocultures. It reduces complexity and, and resilience is some of the main areas that I'm quite interested in. So um, I suppose I'm quite keen to look at the way that we we can respect internationalism but also local distinctiveness um and one of the key aspects of social ecology is this idea of of uh, celebrating unity and diversity at the same time so i'd be interested in any any thoughts about addressing addressing that how do we navigate that difference with uh, unity and diversity so that they're complementary aspects of internationalism thank you uh, steve for <laughs> your comments as well as well question uh comrade uh, marcus please go ahead if you want to respond and then to read kenneth after you thank you you are muted uh, comrade marcus oh, sorry but can i respond please go ahead yeah i'm i'm really that 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 last question about unity and diversity it's, it's central. In fact, all major scientists and activists in the environmental movement, there's an agreement that we can only save the planet through a mass movement based on internationalist solidarity. And it, 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 part of that, in fact, it's central to that, is the issue of diversity. People speak different languages, they occupy different cultural positions, geographical spaces on the planet from India to South America, et cetera, et cetera. But what the climate change or the, the threat to the environment has done, it shows that we are all in the same boat, basically. With all these different people, young and old, Hindus, Christians, Muslims, Jews, whatever. And it's so central and it's not something new. No. And that's why it's always been raised. But any serious, any serious book, any serious idea and engage in any debate, the issue of, uh, of a mass movement based on people's solidarity, not only with each other, but also with nature, it's central. It's the main ingredient for our saving I and mean, for our survival is that solidarity. It's not a good idea. We, we have all the good ideas now. This is now to build that solidarity move. When people are uh, thrown into a mess, flood, it's going to be a disaster management system in which everybody, from the, ch the child to the adult, with all the necessary uh, material and other resources, 
But the main resource is you that understanding and uh, way of life that we need each other. Uh, so I, I think the, now it's very, uh, and, 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 and I think that um, some very uh, hard work needs to be done around that. Because unless we do that, there's no other way, unless humanity with nature come together, we are not going to survive the huge threat to the to the planet. And by the way, it's not the, it's not the physical planet that's going to be destroyed. The, the planet will continue to survive. It's been in existence for over 10 billion years. It's the human life on the planet. It's the environment, the oxygen, the fresh water, clean water, etc., that needs to be to be uh, uh, be saved and managed properly. And that can only be done by people developing. And and it's not about teaching. And I think uh, Comrade Mahmoud, you used a very good word which we use in the social in the children's movement. It's not about teaching each other. It's creating an environment in which we can and that's why children are so important in this situation. So that so we can be so pardon? pardon? No, Com Comrade Mark. I can't hear. Uh, oh, I can't hear. Yes. yes. I'm not uh, yes. supposed yes. that, but it, I'm not yes. supposed to causing that, but it's not from our side. So what do you say? You say? Can, can you hear me from the Comrade Mark? I, I believe that the problem was that uh, Margaret's microphone was not muted and now there's an echo coming through from her side i think she may have lost the connection and it's still open all right sorry about that okay no but you can continue comrade marcus can you hear me now yes we can yeah okay so what let me just end then by saying that the issue of of Building, building a, a, a broad movement on international solidarity is essentially, is essential. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, there's an echo here. Yeah, I think it's because uh, Ma Comrade Margaret uh, left her mic on. That's the reason why it's causing that echo. I think Connor has pointed that out for us. Uh, but other than that, uh, thank you very much for your response to the question of unity and diversity in terms of internationalization. Because internationalism, as you are speaking, we have the ideas, we have the philosophies from Abdullah Ocalan to many others, including those we develop in our context. Uh, it should go beyond rhetorical support statements. You are calling for action and praxis, and that is what we need to focus on. Comrade Kenneth, uh, would you also want to contribute to that question? Uh, Comrade Kenneth? Sorry, just to... Yeah, thank you. you. I think you are able to... Whoever is organizing the meeting is able to mute. Yeah, I would have been able thing. to, Connor, but I was uh, also kicked out for two or three minutes. And when I rejoined, um, somebody else now would have to be the... Okay, no worries. Yeah. It, it has resolved itself now, I think. Okay. Yes, just... I think so, yeah. Okay, sir. Okay. Comrade thank Kenneth. you, thank you, Comrades. I will briefly, yes, thank you. I will just briefly make my, my intervention. Yeah, on that part, the unity and diversity, I think most of the other aspects would be on the diversity, uh, which probably is resolved in the main by the aspect of unity. But the most critical part in my take will be the class aspect of the unity and diversity the obstruction or the most stubborn aspect that cannot be easily overcome is the class aspect of the division. And then the unit would want the struggle of the opposite. But the question I would then say, to the struggle of the opposite, to the side of the oppressed people and organizing diverse, along the line of uh, ecology, ecology, which would mean for us as human beings to develop more or higher consciousness 
so that we can understand ourselves as part of the organisms that survives within the universe. And then we must find now friendship or relationship with that and use our superiority as human beings to understand and study them more and develop to have a love of these other organisms and interpret them and understand their importance of our existence. In the main, it relates mainly with probably what becomes active organisms that we may see. It can start there because they begin to be the first notion of our own knowledge, of our own attraction. Then we can detail them and discover them in the main that how then do they literally come into existence? And then what is their lifestyle and how is their pattern of life? Then once we build that, I think in the main, can promote and um, improve our livelihood because in the method of our unit, the cooperation is only when we seek to get the means of our livelihood. And we are looking only on the products of our product of, of, for, for, for our labor, what we, what we produce and, and eat and, 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 and consume. But yet in the main, we forget that if my interest will be a fish for the table and I'm working there, I'm doing fishing, but we forget that what is the fish on its own. And then we ignore the role of the water and the vegetation in the sea and so on. Then we may even fail to relate to understand that these elements that exist that the fish are feeding on are also part and parcel of our interest of study. We look at one and I will say the only element that can help us to comprehensively sustain the unity in our diversity, diversity in the sense that other people naturally will say, we use this for that and therefore must be respected that our duty is to consume this without even any interest because it's our culture, it's how we are oriented. But if we, we, if we, we, we rely on that without bringing the cohesiveness, we may find ourselves that the diversity become now the strength of our division and then undermines unity and make unity and cooperation as if it is so in, in, uh, unnecessary. So my point is that the cooperation of our work to make to, to, to meet our own interest, our own, our own survival life, must also be accompanied by detailed knowledge. Therefore, our consciousness will help then to understand and protect the environment and even to reverse and change around some of the difficulties that are now understood to have existed in the ecological center that certain species are now under threat of relinquishing of disappearing because of human activity. And therefore, human activity must now try to build friendship with the ecology or with the other elements, in the, including the landscape pattern themselves. How do they support? What is it that must be destroyed? What is it that must be flattened? What is it that must be reorganized? And including other elements that must help in protection, other areas that can be disastrous. So I think in the sense is that only detailed consciousness that doesn't necessarily relate, as Comrade you've stated, that only on the political economy, but also on science itself, that we need to understand that we are part and parcel of a scientific process as human beings. We are part of organisms. Let's have our own knowledge, understanding about ourselves, and then understand even the environment you are in. In that case, then human beings can also develop very good friendship with what actually belongs to us, or what not belong to us, where we belong to, which is the ecology, which is possibly the, the aspect of the organisms in our society. And therefore, contested with what we talk about as industrialization, the advancement, and then what we can produce outside our own relation with the other components of society, we can then also ground them. In my own view, it will then mean the whole fast tracking of the advancement of other aspects of uh, instruments of labor, which are also a cause of the competition that destroys part of the environment. We may also attach certain values in production that can also promote and support the reorganization and then the reinvention and mobilization of organisms in society. And in now, in our better understanding, we may also be making contributions to some inspect where we have learned that other insects or other organisms can also be used to also destroy other elements that are now polluting the environment. I think that kind of knowledge is quite so more important probably to then say, we contest now to say, as human beings, how do we relate with the competition based on technology and also on the areas of supporting the organisms? Because there might be a common competition over technological advancement and also on the 
the preservation of, 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 of a ecological or some organism or species in the in the world. So in that case, it can bring up a, a, a very important vital aspect. Then in the sense that the movement itself must also be associated with conscious building that doesn't necessarily end, as you have stated, on political economy and other aspects, but that deals with the entire understanding of what human being is, but if only when we can define ourselves correctly as an important aspect of species also in the world, as Comedy stated, that we are also under threat, we are more under threat from what we have done as human beings. But then it informs that our activities, economic activities or whatsoever, economic and also otherwise, we are lacking consciousness if then our activity today means we are destroying ourselves for tomorrow. I think that is where I can place, basically place that. But the issues of class is quite important. Then the other components of race, of uh, cultural and diversity and so on, I think they become so dependent on attitude of organization of society, backward society, may value other components. And then that's why we find that at some point, we will find other people saying the systems of chiefs and of feudalism is a better system that can unite people and can also preserve nature. But we have seen also that it has got backward tendencies there's also a corrosive aspect towards nature and also to the ecology. But it is not a solution. I'm trying to say utopian socialism cannot be an option, but backwardness also cannot be an option. Once we progress, we must also increase our own understanding of ourselves, not necessarily what we do not know, because most of the things that exist need our own knowledge. We must make sure that we go down to the basis and say science become the governor of our theoretical understanding and our education and our understanding as human beings, we can easily forge unity and also have good relationship with the, uh, the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Comrade Kenneth, for your uh, answering on the question on the uh, issue of unity, diversity, internationalization, and so on. Uh, comrades uh, Sir Thomas and Comrade Estella, uh, anything from your end as well? Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm not quite sure. Maybe uh, uh, Comrade Chef might uh, want to say something uh, before me, or I don't know. Uh, I would very much like you to comment, but if not, I go ahead. Okay. I can say I can say something. Um, just in terms of uh, thank you guys for this for the interesting interventions. I've I've learned a lot about the struggle as perceived from the south of Africa, um, and my I guess my question is more concretely, uh, re more concrete to international in general. How can we use platforms like this, meetings like this, uh, as as a means of uh, of mobilizing co internationalist consciousness and networks of uh, uh, internationalism. So so think about this platform in relationship to the question of internationalism. And I, that's the first question that I, the, the, uh, thing that I'd like to focus on. And then the second one would be, uh, I, th I think, the legacy of apartheid. Uh, to what are the lessons that we can learn from, from looking at the South African experience with the struggle for self-determination as understood the struggle for self-determination is, is a struggle against apartheid and now a generation after the end of apartheid where are we where where are we now uh, and what what kinds of theoretical and praxeological uh, 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 points of inference can we make so those are the two things that I would like to hear address a little bit more yeah excellent. Yeah, these were two questions which I was also going to emphasize. But I want to start off with one remark. This particular event is happening at a time of an unprecedented, yet to be assessed, world crisis. It is not just a normal crisis where one unfortunately separates issues between ecology, politics, you know, going into, you know, different areas. But where we, <laughs> we as a people have not seen yet what to come because one of the 
amazing reason is, why did we choose Africa? It's become a center of struggle between imperialist powers and other powers around the globe. Starting with Europe. For example, just to give it a starting point, we have Germany and Turkey of all places uniting to build the most vicious kind of military extensive uh, establishments all around Africa, trying to, you know, uh, make sure that they are in control in a possible coming crisis between the U.S., Russia, and China. So Africa has become a center for me of a struggle for of global liberalism, global imperialism, where we yet haven't seen the effects. We have yet things to come, yet we believe that the African people, and I'm talking about us as being part of the Kurdish movement, as peace in Kurdistan, as people who focus on destroying any formation of state, replacing it with a worldwide democratic confederalism. That is our aim. Okay. Yet we see in Africa possibilities of alternative struggles in a big form emerging as some of the initiatives you have explained today and what we have tried to already establish over the past couple of years, all right, through our own intervention, for example, in Kenya. What's the situation in Kenya? What's the situation in Sudan? What is the situation in Nigeria? What is the situation in other parts of Africa? So, in expectance of an onslaught, unprecedented, that goes far beyond a few things of Schulmark or an alternative conservative party. Oh God, forget it, you know? Just look at the criminalization legislation that we now have. We have got in, in the UK alone about 10, 20 different laws where people can be criminalized. And it's not just the cards. No, no, it's not the cards. It's everybody. Okay? It's the trade unionists. It's the people who, who work on the ground in hospitals or who had no profession, is the ordinary people, is the refugee communities, is all the communities. There is no selection being made anymore. Okay? So we are just working of an of an analysis of the reasonable terrorist organization that will affect Britain and Europe and maybe internationally also as an effect. And, I mean, one cannot get through a demand. The person who is working for it, the research is taking now months to complete. That is what is prepared, war against us, war against all the communities. And these are the important issues. How do we link up internationally? And, you know, Africa is, as I said, a very central part of it because that's where they see all the resources, what they want to grab hold of. Europe or America or Turkey or whatever. So we think your computer, your Community is so important to have, to be in discussion with, 
to know how you see the how you see the developments. First starting, so it's educational for us, what you tell us, of course. Okay. We want to find out how much more can we do or not do. How can we build that international solidarity? Okay. So these are vital things. This is an attempt, and I'm very pleased it went they had. Okay. Because of course our ecology, big ecology movement is doing some good constructive work. But it's not enough. I mean, at the head of it is, of course, I have to say, Jack, with his books on self-determination and the Kurdish freedom movement and other books that he has written and articles. And there are other people on the committee who have contributed to this discussion. But it's just simply not enough. We need more people. We need more understanding. Right? So for today, just to give an example, I would like this text to be in writing. I was only able to hear very little of some of the contributors because the hearing wasn't good enough. So maybe some you can consider putting certain documents or what you said, you know, in, that we can publish it. And secondly, to have a proper recording of this event. And then to plan out of that maybe a bigger discussion in Africa. To involve more people. So to make it a process, an educational process. Education, 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 re-examination. Everything is new all the time. We cannot get back with one issue. Never mind bloody Sodak. Never mind Kia Starma or Labour Party. Why even shall we call it, to be frank? Because they only want to drag us back to social democracy. To some sort of acceptable British state. No, it doesn't work. And it won't work. I am absolutely convinced of that. You know, after my 82-year-old life. All right? I really have to say that. I cannot see that. So I really would say to be a little bit more precise, it would be great to have the contributions in writing as documents published, you know, on our that we can circulate it to larger groups to, and to have suggestions for people for another event, maybe involving other uh, communities, be that now in Algeria or in Sudan or, you know, in other parts of Africa. And, uh, and also looking at the conference that we have next year which is six part self determination, so called self determination theorists. <coughs> Sorry, of seminars. And maybe <coughs> we can send you the concept, the draft concept of that, and we hope very much that obviously one of these or in others, you know, depending in which part of the world we go, you will be able to contribute and be speakers and, you know, also help us to uh, circulate, you know, among the broader, your community in South Africa or other parts in Africa. So uh, this will be very important. So I will be sending you this draft, and you are welcome to discuss it and comment. Okay, the draft was originally done by our friend Connor, uh, 
and has seen a few revisions. Uh, but we still continue. I think we should continue to discuss it myself and, uh, you know, and see and take this as another step, you know, to mutually to work together, you know, in a constructive, you know, better. So with this word, I want to thank everybody there. I'm very moved and pleased by all the contributors. And I was very happy that you all did that. But as I said, we need now the recording and we need, uh, and I will send this, uh, this draft concept for the self-determination series. It will probably start in April next year, beginning of April. So there is time uh, to organize it. And as I said, uh, and the original idea, just to say, was Jeff, Dr. Jeffrey Miley, did it, the original proposal drafted by Connor. And as I said, it's at a certain stage now, and I hope, you know, we can constructively develop it further to bring it to a good discussion point. So thank you all very, very much uh, for your contributions today and coming to this, and especially Komoi Babu. Uh, thank you so much. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Comrade Estella, for your words and your summation, as well as the rallying call for our international solidarity to be strengthened with as many voices as we can. Your resounding and your point on education is well taken by us as well. And more importantly, it's a consistent position with regards to a radical change for a better, not only tomorrow, but today, starting very actively and more poignantly towards the nuts and bolts of how to go forward. You've made suggestions with a timeline for a conference taking place next year and how contributions from here and elsewhere outside of the southern region may take place. There were two questions by uh, our comrade Thomas. If uh, comrade Marcus or comrade Kenneth is still with us, please feel free to respond to that because I know it's been a long time. We are here going on for almost our third hour. <laughs> So I don't want to labor <laughs> anything. And, uh, yeah, Comrade Marcus, please go ahead. So, which question are you referring to? Just see the, uh, the if Comrade Thomas can just refresh the questions. You wanted the post apartheid and the second one where he spoke about yep. how would you identify? Uh, well, Comrade uh, uh, Thomas will just repeat that. Yeah, the first question was <laughs> for ideas about how this platform could be used to. Uh, build or strengthen oh. existing internationalist networks. So think a little bit more concretely about what we're doing in relationship to the ethos of internationalism. And the second was uh, more of a general uh, take for us to learn from after a, a generation after the struggle against apartheid, which in some ways you can think of as a struggle for self-determination. What does What is the lesson uh, from the standpoint of the so struggle for self-determination that we get a generation after the end of apartheid? What does it look like for us? Yeah. Just on the first part, I think uh, uh, this is pretty, my own understanding about the, <coughs> this particular event. It is intended to be part of an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. So, and I think... Uh, it has also raised the issue of a good report on what happened here so so that it can be shared. My own position at a very basic level, even with children, is to build a more informed grassroots international solidarity movement. So it's not about a few group of a few people supporting Kurdistan, the Kurds or the Palestinians or Cuba, but uh, people within communities, because there are a lot of divisions even here, uh, you know, um, 
this is the racial divide, this is the gender divide, this is outrageous divide. In South Africa, for example, people see the people from other countries within the in the subcontinent as foreigners. <laughs> then there's the issue of climate awareness about how we need treat and need to interact and relate with the climate. Mm-hmm. Comrade Marcus, I think you muted yourself there inadvertently. God, oh my God, I said all that <laughs> without being heard. I'm very sorry. No, it's fine. I'm sorry, Comrade. No, we can hear you now, Comrade Marcus. Yeah. As we to come back to the issue of where do we go from here, from my own, from my own understanding, it is part of what is an ongoing process. What we need to do, those who met here today, is to give a good account of what was discussed, who was participating, etc. For example, the issue of the children's movement. We would like to call all the participants to raise, to organize their children where they are, and we can then build a, a broader children's movement. For example, we've raised the issue of how we be, help rewild the nature, how we make things, for example, we've produced wonder bags where children use alternative energies. Uh, we, hope to, we are planning for a, a million spent boom to be planted across the Africa subcontinent. Spent boom is a plant that is probably has the highest generation of oxygen carbon dioxide to oxygen. But it's not to say, but it's to raise awareness. Yeah. So the point then is, and I think somebody else raised it, a good report on what happened here, who participated, and then work towards another broader event that can interact with other people in the subcontinent. I think a lot of work needs to be done in our own countries about raising awareness about what the Kurdish movement has done around building a confederation of, uh, 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 um, of, of uh, uh, sorry, just the, 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 the Ozerojabu. And what happened, the yeah, Ozerojabu, sorry. What's happening there? The, the communes, the involvement of women, the participatory grassroots democracy, etc., etc. But I also raise awareness about what does the climate change mean at the very basic level. Food production, survival, interaction with the oceans, etc. Then on the second part, I mean, I think I, 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 wouldn't, I think the issue of uh, self-determination issue is quite central to a lot of this, these discussions. I would suggest that that put on, a, a, for lack of a for time, so that we can begin to deal, because that's also my understanding. Some of the issues that come up are not necessarily going to be addressed today. It needs to be part of that ongoing process. In fact, that agenda will maybe become longer, deeper, etc. Thank you so much, Comrade Marcus, for your response. Everybody who has been here present today, my sincere thanks and appreciation on behalf of Peace in Kurdistan, as well as the organizing team, the executive and all the members who have been part of the ongoing series that <laughs> commenced last year October on the focus of Africa. Of course, this is the third in the series that has been uh, completed. So to Comrade Estella, thank you very much for your commitment and resoluteness. Of course, your experience for decades is what keeps us inspired and going on. Comrade Thomas, your intellectual and academic work, as well as your conceptualization for the series to focus with resistance, resilience, as well as the ways in which we engage with self-determination, democratic confederalism, the ideas of Abdullah Ocalan, and how they have been impacting us here in the global south, as well as how we reflect and work with them in trying to improve our challenges here post-94 and pre-94 in the case of Swaziland and other countries here. Your contribution in the intellectual is well received, your publications as well. 
I don't have to go through the list of all of that because it is well known in academic circles and in the movement. But of course, it is a vital contribution to what we do. Some of us are good on the ground, my comrades, and some of us are good in producing ideas in a way that's acceptable to many to engage with. May the digitization and the dig digital age we are now in also contribute as a platform by which we can connect internationally as well as to ensure that our education with our struggles is brought closer home. We cannot rely on the traditional methods of traveling long distances to meet annually, biannually, and so on. What happens in between those meetings? And these platforms provide vital connectivity for that as well. Of course, we can turn all of these into publications and papers, but then that would be read only by scholars and remain on shelves and how many hits and items they get. And I know that as an academic. So let's uh, have our reach out there. It is important that the forces against imperialism and freedom come together in a very nuanced way that's also accessible to the broader movements in Southern Africa as well as Africa. On that note, I'd like to thank everybody for being here this afternoon. Your contributions, your thoughts, your input have been excellent for us to go forward. Uh, if everybody doesn't mind, you can just put your screens on for a last time so that we can capture everybody that's still here with us on the platform. Solidarity and strength and forward to continued engagement and solidarity. Wonderful. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pambre. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Lovely. Lovely. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>